Well, now is not the time to deal with that. <laughs> you should have dealt with the something in your eye before I hit the go live button. Now you're gonna have to go like this in the front of everybody. Hello, everyone. How are you? Joanna has something in her eye. I oh don't. <laughs> now she's gonna have to rub her eye in the middle <laughs> of a public discourse. That's what we're doing today. We are having a public discourse. Really? Isn't it fun? That yeah. It sounds very medieval. It does. It sounds very official too. When you come here, your boy Jason, here to have a public discourse. Right? No. Many messages. No, no, no. So, thanks for being here. We've got a, we actually have a subject today. I need to say right from the start, and I'll repeat it later. Oh boy. I put the live stream out. I'm like, hey, let's talk about this topic tonight. And I'm not kidding you, like probably 10 or 15 minutes later, I go on my phone, I'm kind of scrolling through the videos that released today. <laughs> and Corey released a video about the very same thing. I promise with my whole heart. Didn't I say, I'm like, look at this. You're like. I was like, um, yeah. I, and I, I mean, this video came out like four hours before I even put the live stream thing out. So. Yeah, because I was like, oh, well, yours would probably like, you put yours out first. And like, he's no, like, no. I was like no. four hours after he like did. So hours. I wasn't copying. I wasn't trying to like, you know, <laughs> do some controversial thing like we're going to do a reaction video to Aquarium Co-op <laughs> and everything he said. <laughs> I had no idea he did that video until I looked after I did. And then once I put it out, I'm like, well, I'm not changing it now because A, I wanted to talk about it and B, there you go. it's been like a month since we've had had a subject to talk about. So and this is what I wanted to talk about. And so, yeah. It's a breeding fish sort of day. It is. All right. We're going to get it from all the people today. Davey says, great to see you guys last Thursday. Great info. Thanks. Glad you were there, Davey. Remember from Motor City Aquarium Society? <gasps> yes. He was repping. He was repping the shirt, too. It was pretty awesome. So thank you. Bravo. Yeah, I appreciate you being there. So yeah, thing, places we were, just want to say thank Was that already? Was that last weekend we were there? Like Thursday and Friday? Yes. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for the people who came out to the Motor City Aquarium Society meeting. And we got to talk about some Lake Tang and you can fish. And there were Lake Tang and Yeekin fish for sale there. People brought them in, and that was really cool. Yeah, so that we was had fun. a great time. And a big thank you to Mike, the fish tank barn, for taking us all around. I always appreciate so much, whether it was Mike or like when I was down in Florida and Grant and Shelby. They they just they it they're spending like a day or two just some serious tour guiding. Around. I mean that is a commitment, and I really appreciate it, Mike, all the time that you spent. Uh, driving us all around the Detroit area so we could see some cool stuff. We got to see your fish room and some cool pet stores. So thank you. And thank you to everybody who came out because it's an awesome group. If you are in, I, I just have to say, say, if you are in the Motor City Aquarium Society, I don't know, realm, the Detroit area, if you haven't checked it out, you really need to. It was a, it was a really great group, group. Everybody there, I can't even talk today. You should know I'm extremely tired. Yeah. And I don't even have a good reason. The reason I am tired is because I was watching too many Seinfeld episodes last night, and I one turned into two, which turned into four. And next thing I know, it was like <laughs> midnight, and I have to get up early. So, oh boy, yeah. So I'm probably not going to make a lot of sense. Mike, thank you very much for the super chat, Fish Tank Bar. Oh, Had a Mike. great time talking, you, taking you guys around. Thanks for coming out. Well, thank you once again for for hanging out with us for the couple days. That was pretty awesome. Good times. And you know what? I remember what else Mike got for us that was super super special? Snow. Thank you. Yeah, Thank that you was very, very much. special. Was very that was beautiful. definitely on the top of my list of things that I were loved it. not special, but no, it was awesome. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so speaking of that, uh, videos that have come out, we did a, a very fast-paced sort of fish room tour of Mike's Fish Room, the Fish Tank Bar. And of course, the idea is if you want to see more, check out his channel. Uh, so we did that. That was Sunday. If you haven't seen it, check it out. He's got some really cool, he's got a wide variety of fish so some different types of cichlids and there are a lot of live bearers there if you're into those sorts of things check it out so uh, and then today what did you do on the small scape on your channel oh talking rasboras talking rasboras best rasboras for 20 gallons and under all right so there you go so if you like rasboras you like nano fish check out the small scape her video that she released today it was all about Raz Boris. Tomorrow, members video will be out. And then Sunday, I will have, of course, a video out for everybody on this channel. So, oh my gosh, what are you kicking over there? You're going to break know. something, and then the whole internet's going to crash, and we're all going to blame you. The whole internet, all over the world. Fair enough. Just tack it right on. <laughs> yep. Uh, places we're going to be, and let's see. 
We've got the Quad City swap coming up. That's in Davenport, Iowa. If you're anywhere near there, it's a fantastic swap. Very large swap. Sure Probably is. The largest Sheesh. swap. Well, it is the largest swap we've ever been to by far. Uh, really cool. So we're going to be back there on the 26th of this month, which is not this coming Sunday, but the following one. We will have fish on the website, usually three or four days ahead of time for pre-orders if you want to check that out. But if you're in the area or it's within an hour, hour and a half, trust me, it is. Or even, I mean, there were people that came from further away than that. It's well worth it. It's pretty cool. The week after that, on the 2nd of April, we'll be at the GCCA swap, also a very wonderful swap. And then for those of you who didn't catch the little announcement, we are doing something new. For those of you who like to buy fish, but like I can't get to a place on a Sunday morning. Well, at the GCCA meetings, at least the ones that we attend, we're doing pre-orders for that as well. And so the GCCA meeting next month is on the 9th. It's a Sunday evening. So if you're busy in the morning and you want to pop by and yeah, might get be fish convenient. on a Sunday evening, you could do that. And then we've got the green water swap on Saturday, April the 15th. And then once that's done, the swap season really slows down. At that point, we just have a couple green water swaps in the summertime, and then things don't pick up until the fall. So if you are somebody who is, and this doesn't just go for this area, I would definitely check if you're not fully aware of, you know, and you like the swaps, you're thinking about going to one, check your area, check your clubs and see when they have them because a lot of them are starting to wind things down in April and they True. don't reappear until September hmm. or October in many cases. So uh, just kind of keep that in mind as you think about your fish plan for the year. So that those are the announcements for this fine day. Man, I got all that done in six minutes. That's pretty good. Good job. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I did that with very, very little sleep. Uh, PB 1973, wish I could get green kuba ties here. I know I spelled it wrong. You were pretty oh. close. You were pretty close. Uh, yeah, they're cool fish. They are definitely cool fish. They're not super, yeah, and they're, uh, it's not probably just around you. They're definitely harder to find sometimes. Mm -hmm. But uh, does Flip usually have them? Yes, yeah, Flip Aquatics. Yeah, if you're looking for nano fish and you can't find them around you because they can be hard to find, Flip Aquatics is definitely a place to go online. Mm hmm for all your nano fish and shrimp needs most definitely <laughs> yep shelby says finally caught a live stream while it is actually live yay that's cool glad you're here while Welcome, we're actually shelby. live unless it's a fake live what's it, what is that called we're like just ai fake? yeah we're ai people now and it's not actually even us we're sitting downstairs you know, watching tv right now and our ais are just doing a thing hello say, you've reached the life model decoy. It's like those scammers, those videos that the, the scammers who scam scammers and they have like the fake yeah. voices that they use. It's really funny. Yeah, <laughs> that's us. Mm. Just gone crazy. Oh, my AI is going crazy. <laughs> okay, so anyway, the, the, today's topic, the topic for this evening is all about fish breeding, selling fish. It kind of, the way I outlined it, I... I, and I just got like little bullet point things I want to talk about. I kind of outlined it as fish breeding and just selling fish in general. And what got me thinking about it is, and we did, a, by the way, we did a whole series on this topic. And I, I put the first video in the description. So for those of you who are watching, if you want to check out the series we did, I, I did a kind of an intro video. That's what's linked. Uh, some things to think about, some of which we'll touch on here. But I, I'm gonna, I want to hit some different ideas compared to what I did in the video. And then we've got an entire breeding for profit series where we started with everything from a 10 gallon, I want to say up to like a 75 gallon, maybe even larger, maybe it was a 125, where we did a whole bunch of breeding for profit ideas. So if you're really interested in this, if you really are thinking about, hey, you know what, it'd be cool to sell fish, breed fish, uh, have a side hustle, a full hustle, a front hustle, whatever you want to call it then that series may be something you'd be interested in. Desert Fish, thank you so much. That was really cool. Desert Fish just gifted five Primetime Aquatics memberships. And so we've got mm. five new primates coming on board. <laughs> we've got Bruce and Medcow and Silver Creek and Kelly and Michelle are all here hanging out with us. One of these times, can you do a community post and ask if you want to be called Primates, Primetimers? We did Prime that. Did you? Well, how do you think I got the names in the first place? None of these names were mine. 
Well, yeah, I know, but have you ever done a vote? Like, which I'd be curious, which one's the most popular? Which one for... we want to settle on? We, do we? Want we don't have. We don't necessarily don't... have to settle. Why I just, do we have I to would... be one called one? Group? We don't have to be. I'm just curious which one will come out ahead. It's just like it's like a sausage race at the at the Brewers Park. You know, they're all winners. You know, they're all running the race. I just want to know. They're not all winners. Who wins? Actually, there's only one. Winner. Well, some of them cheat and push the others down. Yep, and that's part of the game. So the person who got pushed <laughs> down should be more careful. <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much for the stupid chat. Hey guys, just found your page from Search. Oh. Gonna buy a new fish tank for my daughter for her birthday. Looking to keep it under 300 buckaroonies. Uh, any advice? Yeah, 300 bucks can add up really quick, uh, yes. quicker than you might think. So for 300 bucks, you're probably if you really want to go like full on. Like and make sure you cover everything, which is the tank, all the equipment, maybe even the stand. If you're going to put it on a stand, uh, obviously, if you're not, if the tank is not large enough to put on a stand, then you don't have to worry about that. You save those money expenses. There. Yeah. All the decorations, everything. I, I think a 20 gallon is probably a realist. If you're buying everything new, like you're just going to the big box store, Petco, PetSmart, uh, which is what most people do. It's what we do for a lot of our tanks. Um, uh, so that is probably what I would do. And yeah. then if you haven't kept fish before, we have a beginner series. And I think it's like a five or six part series. Watch the whole thing. Watch it with your daughter. She's old enough to kind of understand it and everything. Uh, because, and take it just, take it slow. You know, from video one all the way through, I think video six, it'll pretty much give you everything you need to know before you ever buy the tank. And that can be extremely helpful and it will help you avoid a lot of potential mistakes. So, but yeah, I would I would focus on a 20 because especially if you're new. So if you're looking at that budget and you really don't wanna go over that, I think a 20 gallon is a nice volume. So you still got some, you, you've got enough volume there where you've got some like options, right? If you go really small, like a five gallon or even a 10 gallon, the smaller you go, the fewer the options you're gonna have. Right, but a 20 gallon, you start getting to a point where I think you've got a fair enough number of options. It's still a manageable tank for maintenance. And guess what? If you decide, wow, you know what? My daughter loved this for three weeks and then never looked at the tank again, and now it's my tank and I don't have time to care for it, you're not going to get anywhere close to what you spent on it. But if you turn around and sell it, you also didn't lose a ton of money either. So definitely. That's what I would do. And the, one of the greatest things about the 20 gallon, it's big enough to put in green neons. Sure. That is definitely true. That is definitely true. But it is, is a good size for a uh, nice school of fish. Uh, Duke, real quick, and then we're going to get into the thing. Duke's got a good question. Do you have any tips on filming your fish? I find it impossible to get certain fish in focus. Uh, step back. Yes. So a lot of your faster moving fish, I mean, sometimes... You know, I can tell you guppies, endlers, um, green kubatai. Some of my like imbuna cichlids, they are constantly on the move and they move very quickly. And so at that point, what I'm doing is I'm not trying to focus on a single fish and follow it all around the tank because that just makes people, it makes for bad video. And so what I will do is I will step back from the tank and I will get the entire tank in focus and then just let the fish do what they want. They can swim all around and those for the most part are going to be the shots that you see for the fish that are really moving fast and just don't sit still. Make so. sure all the other lights are off in the yeah, room. Yeah. And if possible, get yourself a nice uh, black blanket, a uh, tablecloth, a cardigan, whatever. Drape it over your back while you're video. If there's all, reflection. Yeah. yeah. Usually yeah. there's there's almost always some reflection coming from somewhere. That yeah, you but if you're, bar, if you're far enough back, that doesn't happen. Uh, we, have a, we have obviously issues because we have a fish room but if you're just filming a tank it's not going to be as big of an option an issue Same. the other thing too and this is a pro tip for you if you move the fish tank light closer to the front of the tank it creates a very different look than if the fish tank light is towards the back of the tank and so True. i will often play with the lights to see what is looking best for the tank at that time so that can be very very helpful okay Breeding fish for profit. I wanted to talk about this. And what the reason I wanted to talk about this subject is I'm on Facebook. I, I, I glance at Facebook. I glance at Facebook groups. I see what people are doing. I think at this point we've got, or I've got, like I don't know, there's probably 5,000 people on our Primetime Aquatics page, by the way, if you haven't checked it out, do that. Uh, Facebook, we're on Primetime Aquatics. There's 
a lot of people there. And then um, where I see things that I'd like to address here today is just on the post that people post. And one of the things I see often, more often than I, I thought I would, is people going from, oh, I just got into the hobby to bam, I've got 50 or bam, I've got five tanks to bam, I want to make fish keeping my life and I want to breed fish. I want to make a bunch of money. And so now I'm setting up a fish room or now I'm putting 30 or 40 tanks in a place and maybe they've only been keeping fish for six months or a year. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But the purpose here is to say, okay, if you, if you are somebody who wants to breed fish and make money, let's think through the best way to do that and not just rush into a situation that could potentially cost you a lot of time, cost you a lot of money, and in the end, be a lot more trouble than it's worth. And that's that's the whole point of tonight's live stream. And that's what I want to try to help people kind of through with this, this thing. Again, we've got the Breeding for Profit series. I've got the first video in the description if you want to see that. But when it comes to what I see, and, it, and it's not just you know going on Facebook or anything like that. It's when I talk to people at swaps, whether it's people buying fish or other vendors or new vendors, I see a lot of things that are like, wow, that's you're really going zero to 100 here pretty quick. Uh, and, and it can be problematic. And so I think the first thing is what I mentioned already, and that is way too many tanks, way too fast. And the problem with that is sometimes people don't fully understand how much time it can take to maintain all of those tanks, right? I have said this a million times and I will now say it a million and one times. I spend almost no time every week maintaining the tanks that you see behind me every week in our videos. That job goes to Luke and Eli, our, our boys. Now I pay them, right? It's not just like, get down there and clean the tanks. No, they are employees. and. I pay them to take care of the tanks and it takes them quite a bit of time to do that. If and when that stops becoming an option, I am either going to have to cut down on the number of tanks or I'm going to have to automate a lot of the, the tanks that we have and do auto water change and all that kind of stuff because I don't have the time, Joanna does not have the time to go down there and maintain 75 to 80 aquariums. So advice, piece of advice number one. Take it slow. And I saw somebody in here, yeah, Kevin, slow, patience, and learn. You just, some, I can just, all right, we're done. <laughs> Kevin said it all. I'm going to be more verbose because that's just how I roll. But Kevin, you hit it. Slow, patience, and learn. That's absolutely true. I love it. I couldn't set it any better myself. Um, don't go too fast. Make sure, especially if you're newer to fish keeping, that you understand what it is you're getting into. And that usually takes time. Uh, again, sometimes we're not accounting for the time it's going to take. And if we're trying to breed fish and make money, well, okay, well, what would you pay yourself per hour? What does your current job pay you per hour? If you were to figure out, maybe you're on salary and you have to figure out, okay, well, what am I worth hourly? What am I making if I breed fish, right? Based on the amount of time it takes me to maintain my tanks, feed the fish, you know, care for baby fish or pull fish that are, are you know, uh, have laid eggs or are holding eggs or, or fry in their mouth, you know, you got to account for all that time. And I think a lot of people would be surprised when they account for their time, not including anything else, not including the cost of the actual tanks or anything else, it becomes a whole lot less, I guess, in, inviting. You know, the idea is maybe not as great when you're like, wow, you know what, if I include all my time, I'm actually making like four bucks an hour. <laughs> it's like I could have made more money if I just went and got a part-time job somewhere at a warehouse or something like that or a, you know, a, a Lowe's or Home Depot. So think about your time. The other thing you want to consider, you're going to have to feed these fish, both if you're breeding or whatever, you're, you're selling fish. And the fish that you have in your fish room, you've got to feed them and you've got power. And so that means your filters cost money, your lights cost money, how are you heating the tanks? We heat the entire basement. It's just far more efficient to do that than try to run 75 heaters in 75 different tanks. It's the reason why we have sponge filters in our fish room because I can't have hang on backs in every single tank. It would just, we don't have enough power. And if, even if we did have the available power in our basement to do that, the cost would be astronomical. It would just, we would go broke within two or three months trying to do that. And so 
consider that as well. Build that into your cost structure, your time and the food and the power and of course all the equipment. And because you have to consider all that when you when you deal with your ROI, your return on investment. You've made an investment in equipment and power and food and in time. And in the end, you've got to make sure that when you are breeding fish and when you're selling the fish, you're making up for all of that uh, time and money and energy and all that kind of stuff. So definitely something you want to, to deal with. The other thing that I think when people are moving very, very fast is they don't fully appreciate most of the people in the United States are not in an area where breeding fish for profit and ramping that idea up, right, to scaling it to a larger degree, most people in this country do not live in the right parts of the United States to do that, to do it efficiently and to really compete. How many of you, if you had to guess, where do you think most big, hardcore fish companies, fish breeders, wholesalers, where do you think they're located? I bet some of you know the answer to that question. Most of them are in Southern Florida, mid to South Florida. And Reef said that right from the beginning. Yeah, Florida. And the reason for that, and this, if you've never been down there and you've never toured, if you've never had the opportunity to tour some of the, the people or the companies that are breeding fish on a large scale, you can't fully appreciate what it is they're doing. And it is really, really, really efficient. You've got people, and this could be anywhere from just the person doing it in their home to a smaller company to a larger company. But think of all the advantages they have compared to most people in the United States. Their weather is consistent. So guess what? They're not wasting energy trying to heat a building from any part of the year, really. Now, that's obviously temperature fluctuates, but they don't have that expense. If they're getting water from a well, they can run that water through and just do auto water change. And they can put stuff outside. And I think that's the biggest thing that a lot of people don't appreciate. And that is we, even myself included, we are confined to a, a small space, right? Maybe it's your home, it's a basement, it's a room. Well, people who can breed large scale they can put IBC totes outside. They can make ponds and put ponds outside. They can put big cement structures outside and big vats and breed fish there and breed them by the thousands. And they can do it a lot cheaper than most people in other parts of the country can. And so I say that only because you need to consider how far are you going to take this breeding for profit thing, right? What is, what is enough? You have to define that. Because if you're thinking, I'm going to turn my whole basement or my whole home into a breeding for profit situation, well, when you start breeding fish in large quantities, guess who you're competing with? All the people who can do it super crazy efficiently down south. That's a quick way to start bringing in competitors that will outprice you. All right, so you got to be careful that you have to be efficient. And so keep that in mind. Now, the second thing. I've seen, and it's it's interesting to me, where people, and I've seen this even with people who do swaps around, like where we some of the same swaps that we do. They take their fish breeding enterprise, fish selling enterprise that was in their home, and they were doing fine with it. And then you know what they do? Move they, it out. They move it out. They move it to a separate structure. The minute you do that, you have now incurred all kinds of additional costs because now if you've moved it to a building now you've got to heat that building you've got to maybe air condition that building you have to drive to that place there's all you have to obviously there's going to be rent or you've purchased that building and now the overhead is way way higher and so you have to consider if the whole breeding for profit thing is something that you would eventually want to move out understand that when you're doing it in your home you have a lot of advantages. Obviously, you're still just paying the mortgage that you've always paid. The, yeah, the, the energy bills go up a little bit, but you still had to heat your home. You still had to air condition your home if that's the case. But once you have that second building and you're adding all that additional cost, now you are competing against all those other people who are still doing it in their home. And they're going to smoke you when it comes to prices. It's just, it's just the way it is, unless they're just making a lot more profit. Either way, they're, they've got a significant advantage at that point. Yes, you can scale up, but again, 
if you're scaling up in a location and now you've crossed paths with the people who are south and you're not already down there, well, now you've hit their territory in, in terms of their ability to supply um, fish stores and even wholesalers at that point, you've hit that area as well. So you just have to be careful. If you're going to move out and, and take that business and move it to a separate building, you could be in making some competition that you didn't realize you were you were you were hitting right would you like to add anything before i continue no you're, you're doing good am i am i doing okay you're doing all right um the other thing to consider is i think some people who are are trying to breed for profit don't fully appreciate what they're up against and that is when i go to the a lot of us when we go to the swaps or auctions or even you know pet stores pet store owners a lot of people are either are selling fish as just part of the hobby. They're actually not all that interested in making a bunch of money. It's not a business for them. And they, quite frankly, there's quite a few that don't care if they make a bunch of money. At the swaps, they're just, a lot of them are retired. And they're just like, you know what? I'm going to go there and I'm going to make a little bit of money, a little bit of pocket money. Get it's going to be a little bit worth my time. I'm going to hang out and see all the, you know, the people that I like to hang out with. I mean, that's one of the funnest things for us is trust me, it is not fun getting up at 3.30 in the morning. Mm -mm. That is not the fun part of the swap. Bagging all those fish is not fun. Mm -mm. What is fun is going to see everybody else that we get to see you know, a couple times a month. Fish peeps. And the people who come in and we get to talk to them. So that's a lot of fun. And so you have to keep in mind if you are breeding for profit and you are actually trying to make a profit, a return on investment, whether you're selling to a pet store or whether you're going to a swap or an auction, you are going to be competing with people who actually are like, I'm happy if I if I'm if I make a profit. I don't need to make a lot of money. This is just something I do for fun. Or some people are like, you know what, I really believe that I want to get these really cool fish into as many people's hands as possible. And then you're sitting there trying to make a profit, but their their prices are so low. It's like, well, they're just buying all their fish and their fish are just as good as mine. And now we got a problem. All right? So you just have to keep that in mind. You know, keep in mind who you're competing with. The next thing, especially if you are going zero to sixty very, very quickly, and I, this is a this is a big one. This is the one that I'm like, wow, okay. Um, you get somebody who's only been keeping fish for six months to a year, and don't get me wrong, that's a nice amount of experience for a hobbyist, right? At a year, you're you're getting to a point where you're learning a lot, right? You are, you're learning a lot, but have you learned enough? to deal with all of the potential issues that go with either just straight up selling fish or breeding fish for profit or buying fish and growing them out or whatever it is you're gonna do, right? And what I mean by that is, do you truly understand the, the behavior of the fish? This is important because if you're breeding, you have to know how these fish are gonna breed, right? And so if you're wasting time trying to figure that out, every week that goes by that you're not breeding that fish is a tank that is taking power, is taking time, is taking energy, you're trying to maintain it, and you're not making money. Again, we're talking about breeding for profit, not just the average hobbyist. Like, well, yeah, that's part of the fun. That's part of the challenge. Of course it is. But we're talking about making money, right? So you have to take time to understand the fish. When you, even if you figure out how to breed that fish, do you understand its normal behaviors? If you're just bringing fish in and growing them out, do you understand how they're supposed to act? Because that can be a problem in and of itself. If you are bringing in fish and just growing them out, which is also, it's not necessarily breeding for profit. I would call that growing fish out for profit. Another video that we did a while back. If you bring fish in and they're not acting right, but you've never had them before and you don't have any experience with them, you may very well wind up with a fish that's sick and you don't even realize it until it's too late, right? And so that can create a lot of problems in a very short period of time. And so you wanna have the experience to know how do the fish normally act? How do I breed these fish if I ever done it just for fun? Because then that's the time when you start thinking about, okay, maybe I can get into this and other people will like the fish too, right? Do you understand your market? That takes time and new fish keepers often that's not something we're always thinking about. Do you understand what fish are gonna be profitable in your area? Because I can tell you, hey, these fish breed these, these are gonna do great. And in your area, they might do horrible, right? And so if you are in an area in the upper Northwest and I'm like, oh my gosh, you've gotta breed shell dwellers. They're just, people go crazy for them here and you breed them up there, but everybody's got soft water with a lower pH and they all just die. 
you're going to end, not to mention the fact you had to go through the process of making your water harder so that they would be happy. Now you're trying to sell fish and trying to convince other people to mess with their water parameters and the average hobbyist doesn't want to do that. Or now you're trying to sell them to a pet store and the pet store is like, hey, you know what? Yeah, these gold oscillatus, these shell dwellers are so cool. They got great color, but I can't sell very many, a whole lot of them because if people come in and they're not used to making their water harder with a higher pH, they wind up killing them. Then I got to refund their money. And so then I'm losing money and I'm, I'm creating bad blood between me and my customers. So I really don't want those fish, right? So be careful when you see people online saying, breed these fish and you're going to make a bunch of money. You have to recognize your market and that takes time. What that means is go to all the pet stores, see what they're selling. You don't have to even talk to the pet store owners. I'm not saying go in there and hound everybody. Hey, what's your best selling fish? I'm going to breed it for you. You don't even have to do that. You know how you're going to know that? When you walk in there week after week or month after month and you see, wow, they are constantly bringing this type of fish in. It's a certain type of tetra or a group of tetras or rasboras or cichlids or some weird type of specialty fish, you know, oddball fish. You're like, wow, they bring a lot of these in. And then I go to three other pet stores in the area and they're, they're all got their niche and they're all moving certain types of fish. That gives you a lot of information, but that also takes time. If you're at, you, if you're at swaps, right? If you've got swaps in your area and you're trying to breed fish and sell them there, right? You're trying to get an idea of not only what people are breeding, but how are you going to compete, right? And so that, that's my other, my next point, I think, is you got to know your competition, right? When you're breeding for profit, you have to know what you're up against. We've kind of addressed that already with knowing your competition means how big of a commitment do you want to make? How many tanks do you want? How much square footage do you want? And so that's going to help determine who you're going to compete with, right? So the other thing too, you have to understand that some of the fish that are easy to breed, like, oh, I'm going to just get into the hobby and I'm going to breed, I don't know, mutt guppies, just various platies and mollies and Maybe I'm going to breed some peacock cichlids and some imbuna. There's, those are all great fish. And there is a market for those fish. But you also have to understand, those are often fish that people breed at first because they are some of the easier fish to breed, provided that you have the water parameters for them. So if it's relatively easy to breed those fish compared to other types, a lot of other people are breeding them too. But not only that, you're going to be competing with people who well, I didn't want to breed them on purpose, right? So you, how many times have you heard, yeah, I got some guppies and now I got a tank full of them. Yeah, I got some mollies, I've got some platies and now I'm overrun with them. Uh, that will happen. So I'll give you a really good example. Shell dwellers in the Chicagoland area. The Maltese, you guys have all seen the multi tank, the 50 gallon low boy. Well, guess what? You throw in six Maltese and a 50 gallon low boy and within a year to a, I don't know, maybe 15 months, you might have 100. And so if, it's, if the fish are not in that market already, it's really easy to move those fish. You're thinking, wow, this is great. This is awesome. And then all those other people get those fish and they get a half a dozen. And now they've got a bunch of fish and they're moving them out. And so all of a sudden you're starting to see the prices go ch -ch 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 and get lower and lower and lower and lower until you get to a point like we were talking last week about Neolampelagus brichardi. Great fish, but they breed like crazy. Ooh, and yeah. once they fill up a tank, you're like, what am I going to do? They're basically like the guppies of Lake Tanganyika and cichlids. Once you get them, you're like, what am I supposed to do with these? Guess what? Everybody's in the same boat. What am I supposed to do with all these fish? It's the, one of the reasons why I love that fish. We had a 37-gallon tank set up for it. And guess what? I broke it down. I took all the rest of the brochardia I had. I moved them out to the swaps. I kept one of the best males. I put that in the 125. I threw a few other ones in the uh, a different 125 with the peacock cichlids. Don't judge me. It's worked out fine. They're all doing great. And I'm like, that's it. I, I don't want to breed these anymore because they're just a little bit too... Uh, there, there's no return on investment in those fish. I can still enjoy them, but I don't have to keep a whole tank filled with them. Uh, large South American cichlids. Right? It's really fun to watch a pair of Oscars sitting on fry. They're great parents. Somebody else mentioned convict. I saw a comment come through here, convict cichlids. That's fun too. Great parents. And when they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of fry, what are you going to do with them? These, and especially we're talking about fish that get large, right? So now you've really limited your customer base in this case, because not everybody can deal with a 
you know, an eight inch or nine inch convict or a 12 to 14 inch Oscar, a lot, not a lot of people have that space. And certainly in your area, if you've got three or 400 of these things, how are you gonna move those, right? Pet stores aren't gonna want all those fish. You're not gonna be able to move them at swaps most likely. I will talk about the online avenues here in a second, but you just have to be really careful because they can be really, really difficult to move. I remember we had our Midas cichlids breed. <laughs> it's in the video. If you ever, if you ever want to go back to our Midas cichlid care video, it was really cool because I was in that video. I love when I'm able to do this. I was able to show the fish from when I got them when they were small, watch them grow up, watch them mature, and then we had the pair Roger and Ruby, and then they <laughs> had Fry. I'm looking at the 75 gallon like there has got to be like a thousand fish in this tank. Uh, and I think we, we were able to sell a bunch. We gave a bunch away. I think somebody picked up at one point like 50 of them when they were like not even an inch. And it was, you can overrun an entire market with large South Americans, Central American cichlids in a hurry. No matter how cool they look, there's just, there's probably not a market for all those fish. Nope, there'd have to be a big market. Yeah, you remember all those fish? I sure do. Yeah, that was crazy. So again, when you're thinking about breeding fish for profit, you really have to be thinking about the fish that are going to do well in your area. And once again, that will take time. That is not necessarily something you want to be learning after setting up a fish room with 20, 30, 40, 50 fish tanks. Like, yep, I'm going out there and I'm going to make fish breeding my thing. If you don't know the market, you could potentially waste a lot of time and a lot of money and have a bunch of fish and be like, I don't know what to do with these. It turns out, yeah, I bred them, yay for me, but nobody wanted them. And so now what am I going to do? So that's, I mean, that's a really important aspect is knowing which fish to breed and knowing which fish are going to overrun a market in a hurry. The competition thing, I think, is something I want to talk, and we're almost done, and then we'll take your questions here in a few minutes, but I think the competition thing is big, and I've kind of touched on it a couple times already. And, you know, again, fish that are easy to breed, that could be a problem, right? The other thing to consider, and not enough people talk about this, and this is actually one of the things that I was thinking like, wow, you know what? There are people out there who are like, okay, you know what? Yeah, I'm not going to, the guppies in my area are overrun. Maybe I'm not going to breed. I, I'm not going out of my way to breed a bunch of different shell dwellers. I mean, they breed, but I'm not trying to like enhance their breeding. I actually took down one of our multi tanks. I sold those out. I'm like, all right, I just got the 50 gallon low boy now because I've got all these fish. I can't just keep breeding them and then not have anywhere to, to bring them, right? So when we're, we're considering that, you also have to consider something else that not enough people are talking about. And that is, are the fish you are breeding cheaper for other people just to bring them in, whether that's through a wholesaler or an importer. They're so cheap that, yeah, not a lot of people are breeding. I hear all the time. People ask us all the time, why don't you breed tetras? Why don't you breed rasporas? Why? Why would I want to take up an entire tank to breed fish, to grow out these minute? First of all, there are a lot more, it takes a lot more effort to breed barbs, tetras, rasboras, rainbow fish, these egg scattering fish with these minute little tiny fry. And now I have got an entire tank dedicated to those fish for many, many months before they get to a sellable size. And in the end, pet stores and all kinds of people are just bringing these fish in and they're bringing them in for pretty much about, when you figure in my time, the food, the energy, they're bringing them in for less than I can sell them for and actually make an ROI, a return on investment. I'm not saying don't breed those fish because your area could be very different. But what I am saying is you have to not only consider what other people in your area are breeding, but also, and this takes time and experience, what people are, pet stores or your, your you know, swap people, what are the, how are they bringing the fish in? Because if you can't compete with them because they're not wasting tanks you know, for four months or three or four months to get these fish to, to grow out, you could run into a problem in terms of pricing, right? Again, how are you going to compete on price? The I already mentioned this, but take a look at swaps in your area if you have them. All right? Look at what people are specializing in. I'll, I'll give you an example. I love angelfish. I would actually like to breed angelfish at some point uh, just because I find them beautiful. Some of the, the really kind of rare angelfish, but I'm never going to do it. You know why? 
because there is a father-son couple. They're the cans. Yeah. I want to get over there. I, I need to get over their fish room. I want to I want to film their fish room. They are exceptional angelfish breeders. And what I mean by that is you go to the swap and I look at their the fish that they're selling and their their angelfish look amazing. They've really got it down and they're selling them at a price that is outstanding. I mean, if you go to the GCA, GCCA swaps, I think they might be at Quad, at Greenwater. If you're looking for angelfish, and again, I'm not, it's not like a sponsor or anything like that. I, I mean, I, just, I know who they are and I talk, I'm friendly with them, but it's not like they're paying us to say this. They've got some of the most amazing angelfish I've ever seen. So it's like, why would I try to compete with them? It doesn't make any sense because they're already doing such an amazing job with the angelfish that I, I almost feel bad when new people come in to the swaps and they're they try to sell their angelfish at not retail but at maybe a slight premium because they think they're great. And then you look across the room, it's like that guy's got a whole table filled with stuff that he's been breeding. That and by the way, these angelfish are not. I'm not. Yeah, they'll sell them small, but some of them are big, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm like that black angel's like. 12 bucks at a pet store at that size, probably be $50. So you have to really think about, you know, who's, and, and that could happen to you at a pet store too. You could walk into a pet store and be like, hey, I've got, I, I've been breeding angelfish and I like to sell you angelfish. And the guy could be like, well, you know, I've got a guy who's got 40 years of experience breeding angelfish. And every time I get the angelfish, they're perfect and I don't lose any. So now you've already committed to breeding some angelfish. You're like, well, you want to try mine? What incentive does they do they have if they're already getting them at a good price? And so again, you want to be able to kind of see what's going on in your area, whether it's swaps or whether it is pet stores. Also keep in mind when we're talking about ways to breed fish and make money, the pet store I think is the least profitable way to do that. Selling your fish to a pet store is the least profitable way to sell fish because they've got overhead. And they're gonna have to get those fish. A lot of people are like, wow, you know what? How come this fish you're selling for eight bucks, can't you give me $4? Maybe they will. Most pet stores are like, I'm not, no, this is not, we're not <laughs> splitting this. I've got overhead, I've got bills to pay, I've got employees to pay, I need to make a living, I got a house payment. Uh, you know, maybe you're getting, again, it depends on the fish, depends on the area, depends on the pet store, but 25, 30% of the sell price? It's like, well, at that price, I'm selling it to you for, at this point, maybe the same that you're getting it for wholesale, but my fish are a little healthier, so that's the advantage. But you might be better off just try, trying to find a swap or an auction. Or the last one is online. And so maybe you start to sell your fish online. Now, a lot of people ask us. We, I mean, we were probably asked this 10 times a week. Why don't you sell online or do you sell fish online? And the answer is always no. And the follow-up answer is, I don't think we ever, not I don't think, we're, I don't see us ever selling fish online. And there's a couple reasons for that. Can you think of one reason why you don't want to sell fish online? Yeah, Flip Aquatics. <laughs> yeah, well, Flip Aquatics, yeah, because there are companies like Flip Aquatics who have that methodology just absolutely nailed. They do such a fantastic job. But what you have to understand, for those of you who are considering, okay, well, I've, I'm going to breed fish. How am I going to sell the fish? Okay, so we talked about swaps and auctions. We've talked about pet stores. Swaps and auctions are going to be a, they're going to give they're probably going to get you a, a greater return on investment than selling them to a pet store. It's, in, in my opinion, around here at least, pet store is the worst way to do it. Online, you could potentially make more, but there's one thing you have to consider, and it's the one thing or one of the things that keeps us from doing it: customer service. I don't like to do it. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to do customer service. No, that's I do. A, I love it. Full time job. It's right a there. full time job. At that point, mm -hmm. here's the benefit that we have to doing what we do at a swap. We bag our fish in the morning. A swap usually starts at GCCA is nine thirty. Quad is noon. Green water is ten o'clock in the morning. We bag those fish in pristine water. Water that it was set out the night before. It's at the perfect temperature. It is perfect water bag them up, the bags look great, plenty of air. We bring them to the swap. By 10.30, most of the people have picked up their fish. You know what we're doing? We're taking the bags out. Oh, look at that. All the fish look great. They know the fish look great. Here's your fish, a very personal connection. I love that. I, I, For those of you who come to the swaps, I absolutely love that personal connection. 
right? I get to hand off our little babies <laughs> to you. And I get to and wave bye-bye. We've quarantined those fish for four weeks, which means they were doing great in our tanks for a month, right? You know that as well. And so you're like, oh, wow, this is great. Here you go. So that's an awesome exchange. And because of that, we have very, is it perfect? No, because there's, there can always be something that happens. But it's generally speaking, the one of the best ways to make that transfer from breeder or seller to customer. If you start shipping fish, A, that personal connection is probably lost. And so now you have a customer and you're just a business. They order fish from you. You now have to take those fish. You have to ship those fish. You have to make sure the temperatures are right and consistent as possible from your location to whether, wherever they're going to go. And by the way, we're going to talk about this more in a second when I wrap this whole speech up. Sheesh. I know, right? Going on forever. Mm -hmm. uh, you probably could have just chilled out for about 45 minutes. She right. Like, Do I need to sit here for all this time? Yeah. But, no, it's yeah. not going to be long. No. Well, I, I lied. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, no, I forgot what I was going to say. Something about shipping fish online. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got to make sure that everything is consistent. Temperature is consistent. Uh, inevitably, you're putting your fish in the hands of somebody else who probably, it's just, you know, they're a shipping company, right? What do they care? They're just going to pick your box up and hopefully, you know, they're kind of gentle with it. It winds up in a customer's hands, hopefully next day. And then, by the way, if I were to recommend anything, if you're shipping fish, always, always 100% of the time, next day, right? No two or three day shipping. You're just asking for much more problems so now they get the fish did they all arrive alive maybe they did maybe they didn't but at least when i was at the swap i knew they were alive if you ship them did they all arrive alive if they didn't now what do you do right now you got to deal with refunds or shipping new fish you've got the cost of shipping in there and so you've got all those issues you've got a lot more people asking questions about hey i've got this fish i'm thinking about ordering it and so we've got a lot more customer service for given the, if you've got the same volume there's a lot more customer service involved okay also once you start shipping fish now you're competing with everyone who sells fish online so all the people on aquabit all the major companies that ship fish all the people you see on facebook and instagram and youtube are all shipping things and and doing all that so your your competition has just gone through the roof right and if you're newer and that's been a theme here if you're newer to keeping fish and shipping fish there's a lot more risk there Okay, and so you just have to understand. Now, online can be a great way to do that, but it can also be pretty challenging as well. Last thing, and now I get to your questions. You have to know the trends and the seasonality of the industry, and again, that takes time. You know, if you're at, you know, you've only been fish keeping for six months or a year, you might know a few things, but you, like for us, it's very obvious, and probably to most of you who've been at it for a while, there's a fish keeping season. And that fish keeping season generally really starts to get going in November. And usually by April, people are like, oh, I still love my fish. I still take care of my tanks. But I don't know, kids' sports are taking place. The weather's getting nice. I want to do a picnic. I want to go on a road trip. I want to go on vacation. And so people aren't as engaged. It's things you have to know, right? If you're breeding for profit, now you're depending on that money. Well, guess what? You have to know things could potentially slow down for you from around April all the way through maybe September, October. I'm not saying things are just going to dry up completely, but it does, generally speaking, get slower. The other thing that you have to keep in mind is that there are going to be trends, and I kind of already mentioned this with the shell dwellers, certain fish are going to be popular, and you're going to be doing great with them, and then all of a sudden that market is going to dry up. This is another reason why I don't like dedicating tanks for months on end to grow out fish if I'm breeding them because there can be a market that you identify that might be popular. And by the time you get your fish ready to sell, that market could already be dried up, right? So you really have to take time and understand the market that you're in. What are the hot fish? What are the fish that sell consistently over time? Because you need to identify those because once you get into a trend or you get to a fish that's relatively easy to breed and then a lot of people in your market have that fish, it's going to dry up pretty fast. And you have to be able you have to be able to take that tank, break it down, get rid of the breeding stock, and move on to something different. All right? And that can be a little bit cumbersome to do. So the, the moral of the story is take your, as Kevin said, take your time, be patient, learn your market, learn the industry learn the fish and if you do that and take it slow right the breeding for profit thing can be fun but take it one tank at a time 
right? How am I doing with this tank? Am I, if, am I meeting all those requirements? Am I, am I able to move the fish and is it worth my while? Then you add the second tank. You know, then maybe you add a, a dual or a triple stand or you now have a small wall. And then you just, it, it's something that what we've done is it's always just been natural. It's been a natural progression. Nothing ever felt forced. Nothing was ever like, oh boy, we just did this. If this doesn't work, we're in big trouble. I've never had to feel like that with our fish. I don't know, have you ever felt like that? Like we did something where it was like, oh my gosh. What did we do? Yeah, no. I've never felt like if this, you know, I've, we put ourselves in a position where it's gonna be. It's everything we've always done when we did like, okay, here's a rack, you know, we're setting aside for breeding or, or something like that. Or here's a wall, or now here's half our fish room. It's always been a very natural thing. So that is what I wanted to say. That's like your longest it, ever. Yeah, that really was a oh long time. Goodness. Sorry about that. You're, now I'm going to go away. You can talk the rest of the time. Now to answer a whole bunch of questions, you're going to need to keep your answers brief. I will do so, my very best. Do you have anything? Have you been staking out the whole situation? Um, I have. Here's the latest one here. This is coming last. So a lot of people who have asked your questions early on in this guy's spiel may have to ask him again because yeah. it's gone now in the ether. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. This one, uh, this is from Zeus. Can you please answer my question? What is one amazing way to give your favorite fish, the humble geophagus, the best captive diet? I love these fish and want them to have variety. So I'll just tell you what I feed geophagus, and they've. I mean, we we keep a lot of them. We've got a couple hundred of them in the fish room right now. Uh, they, I feed. All right, let's see. I'll do blood worms from time to time, but it's not like a main staple. We feed all of our our processed or prepared foods are all north fin. So north fin cichlid pellets. Uh, we will do community pellets, kelp flakes, krill flakes, uh, the community and cichlid flakes. So they're getting a variety there. Believe it or not, small geophagus, they go absolutely insane for live baby brine shrimp. It's crazy, but they absolutely do. Uh, hmm. One of the things that I've That's been cute. doing in the fish room the last week that nobody knows about, except for now you're going to know about it, is I've been... I've got a culture of Daphnia going, and they go crazy for that as well. So that's pretty cool. I'll do a video on that later, but um, I have a culture of Daphnia going. Uh, frozen brine shrimp, they like that a lot. And so I found that that, generally speaking, is a pretty good variety. And I've always had good luck with geophagus. I mean, the one that we've got in 150 right now is probably one of the oldest fish in the fish room at this point, at least eight years old, probably older. So that's what I do with them. Uh, this is a, a name from the past here. James Nature Aquatics in What's the house. Up? What's up? Hey, James. I haven't talked to you in forever, although I haven't been on Instagram since the Christmas, the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Yeah. So anyways, and that's usually where I would kind of chat with you. But, um, oh, James gave Thank up. you very much for the super chat. Appreciate that. Thank you, that. James. I hope you, you are well. Uh, Sue said, can you do a care video on Malawi trout? I'm interested in starting a tank for some. I've never kept them. Malawi trout. Yeah, I think I think we're talking about the. Um, I think that's the one that Mike has, the one I just filmed. Mm. So he's probably. I, I wonder if he, I, although his are pretty young, so I don't know if he's done a video on those yet either. But so when it comes to species profiles and stuff, if I don't have them in the fish room and I haven't, I don't have what I would consider to be sufficient experience with them. I generally won't. There's a lot of fish out there, and there's a lot of fish I have never done species profiles on because I haven't kept them long enough to really feel like I know the fish based on my personal experience. And that's really important to me. The, the species profiles that you see on our channel are not just me. I'm not saying that you know a lot of people do this, but I know some do because when you're watching a YouTube video, you can always tell when somebody is doing a video on a fish or on a subject that they Google as opposed to doing a video on a fish or a subject from personal experience. And I never want my videos or our videos to feel like you're getting something that we Google just because the subject is in demand and then we put something out without the experience. So I haven't kept it. That's a long worded way of saying I haven't kept the fish so it probably won't be anytime soon, unfortunately. Because <laughs> I don't want to shortchange everybody and be like, uh, here, here's a video and uh, I think this fish is cool. I haven't kept it or I have it, I've had it for three weeks and this is what I found Here's a out. picture of it. <laughs> yeah, I like to keep them for a long time. James says, hope to see you at, to at Aquashella soon. Yep, 
that is the plan for both Dallas in May. You got it, dude. Uh, was that May 20th-ish, somewhere near 19th, say so. 20th? May and, and November, uh, right? First week in November for Daytona Florida. Beach. Florida. Cool. Yep. That would be cool. Tom says, love and my three Alta, excuse me, three Alta fronds I got from you guys mm. about three or four months back. At Greenwater, slowly but surely growing up. Well, that's cool. I'm glad to hear that they're doing great. It's a majestic fish. And all geophagus take time to grow, but when they do, it is well worth the wait. And they will hopefully give you years of enjoyment after that. Tim says, Jason, when are you going to write a book? You know, here, you don't even know this. That'd be cool. Well, first of all, I have written two, or, or am a lead author and editor of two lab manuals. And I have thought, Hey, microbiology and biology uh, <laughs> manuals. That's a science joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I never had the desire to write a book up until about a month or two ago. Really? And all of a sudden I was like, you know, I think it would be pretty cool. This is a life thing yeah. just to write a book. Me too. Somewhere related to fish keeping. I don't know what it would be about, but. Coffee table book on coffee tables. Yeah, yeah. I'll be. I'll just write a Kramer book on fish. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but some, I, I don't know, maybe someday. It'd be pretty cool. Legend says, I wish it wasn't so hard to get a shipment of fish to Hawaii. <laughs> I, bet. I bet that's probably a whole lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But then again, you have Hawaii. Renee says, Joanna, what does your shirt say this evening? What is the, what does your shirt say? You oh, always want here. a weird one. I got it's, a lot of shirts. It's tree beard. It's tree beard. It what says, does it say? Um, it says, um, what? Wait, what doesn't make sense to me? And then it says at the bottom here, it says, but then again, you are you are very small. Okay. Because get it, everybody's smaller than Tree Beard. That's right. So well, I got it. That's his line in the movie too. I'm aware of that, but it's just Actually, funny no, it's, for me. You're very smart. But then again, you're very smart. Uh, oh, Renee, oh, oh, hold on, that was, yeah. uh, JK said, do you guys take pre-order requests for gender of fish if easy to determine? Short answer is no. And the reason for that is when we are doing swaps, like so for instance, this Quad City swap, I fully expect to wake up at probably 3.15 or 3.30. It won't just be the two of us. Um, we'll probably have a couple other people down there that really don't know much about fish. They can take a net, they can catch the fish, and they know how to count. That's what I need. The, the just crazy amount of energy expended to get all I mean we're bagging well north of 100 bags of fish in a very short period of time half awake so I mean it's one of those things where we wake up that alarm goes off at 3 30 pop out of bed I go I grab you I'm like let's go get up he's up out of bed in like three minutes and we're downstairs five minutes after we've opened our eyes and it's just go 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 so that's why I never guarantee males females it's just like hey if you want that the more you buy the higher the likelihood that you're gonna get both and it's just, we are, and I mean, from the time we wake up to the time we leave, we are like 100% go, 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 bagging up the fish until we're out the door. And that's, I think that's why once we get to the swap and get the table set up, we're like, ah, oh, this is the easy part now, hanging out, you know, and talking to people for three hours. Yeah. <laughs> JK says, uh, bagging with one eye open. Pretty much. That's pretty much. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> mm. All right, let me see. What did you got? You got something? It's always fun when you get a bag of fish and there's also a bonus shrimp in there. Yeah, that's what you do sometimes. It's a good luck shrimp. Yeah, it's happened. MNC says, new fish room tour video soon? Probably in the next month or so because the last oh. one we did was last summer. And a lot has changed. I was pushing them off to once a year because before we started bringing in a bunch of fish, not a lot was changing. I mean, the fish would get a little larger, but we've always been the type of people where fish are our pets and we... Yeah, they get a little bit, they grow, but it's not like we're just turning tanks over for the sake of YouTube and be like, oh, hey, here's some new fish. Got these new guys in just because. Yeah. But now with such a large portion of our fish room dedicated to bringing stuff in, we get a lot of cool things. And so hopefully whenever we do the next fish room video, we'll have a bunch of cool stuff for you to see. That'd be super awesome. Yeah. Oink says, uh, before your full size book, I think an article in Amazonas magazine would be a great place to start. I all right. I gotta be. I don't know if I'm up to that level. I'm not. I am nowhere near at that level that you see with the Amazon authors that are speaking about specific genre, uh, genre of fish or or uh, species or locations. 
I mean, you have to understand, and this is what makes Amazonas so cool. And by the way, Amazonas' magazine is up there now behind your head. Is it? Uh, we worked out a, a special offer with Amazonas, which is in the description below, uh, where you can get a special offer of Primetime Aquatics viewers do. It's the coolest magazine ever, but it the really point is, is the, the reason why it is cool is because it's it's not like a hobbyist. These are experts, like true when you go to a, a meeting and you see somebody who's like been in the muck, in the mud and on the riverbank and they're catching these fish and they're bringing them home and the first people to ever figure out how to breed them. Like when you read those articles, they're like, yep, I first encountered this fish back in 1978 in a small group in an unknown puddle in the middle of Australia. And we brought these fish back. I brought back 15 and four of them survived. I was lucked out. I got two males and two females, and I began to figure out how to spawn a fish that no one's ever seen, nor that they know existed. And thanks to me, now the fish is spread worldwide, and now I can talk about them and tell you all about this fish. And you got somebody else doing the same thing for another fish. That, that's, I've kept fish a long time, but I am not at that level where I'm the person bringing the fish from some continent far off land and like really really getting in there and working with these fish and trying to get these really difficult fish to breed. Are you ready for a very timely question? I am ready for a timely question. Because this question is coming from Ireland. Love it. It's from uh, Thomas or Tomas. Uh, hi guys, Tom from Ireland. Setting up CO2 in my discus tank. My pH is 8 and parts per million around 350. I am automatically reading my pH. What's the safe pH to drop to for the fish during the day from 8? Happy St. Patrick's Day, too, by the way. So hold on. The, the parts per million was 350. So is mm -hmm. that TDS? Because TDS, you're, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to measure KH, carbonate hardness, because the carbonate hardness is the buffering capacity of your water. And so with a TDS of 350, you, it's very reasonable to have a... a KH probably somewhere close to eight to ten or twelve, right? I mean, it's it's possible. It, it might not be. Maybe you've just got a lot of uh, general hardness in there. But if your KH is on the harder, if you have harder water and your KH is on the higher side, you might not get a dip in pH just because you're running CO2, especially if you're running the CO2 properly, right? And so the number of and I don't run CO2, but the the bubble count is sufficient so that the plants are taking it in, but it's not really winding up in the water all that much. So that hopefully isn't going to be a big issue because the plants will be taking it up. If your pH is going to drop, it's probably actually going to drop at night. And the reason for that is once you shut the, it sounds backwards, but once you shut the CO2 off, once the lights go out, if you have a lot of plants in the tank, right, or even a, some algae, what will happen is all of those plants that were doing photosynthesis during the day, they switch to the same type of metabolism that we have, which means they start breaking down all those stored sugars. And instead of producing oxygen and taking the CO2 out of the water, they do the opposite. They start consuming the oxygen and then breaking down the sugars and producing CO2 at night. And so actually, if your CO2 regulator is, is properly is running properly, you're probably going to have, if there's going to be a pH dip, that CO2 in the water at night could form carbonic acid, which would lower the pH at night, probably not during the day. But again, if your KH is relatively high, I would say high single digits, you know, 10, 11, somewhere in there, let's say 8 to 12, you're probably not going to see a pH swing. All right? At least it's, it's relatively unlikely. If you've got no KH, then you could start to see a little bit of a swing, but I, I think it would probably... I would love to hear, as you do that, if you test it, I, I bet it would go lower at night than it would during the day if the CO2 is running properly. Now, to answer your question, what would be an acceptable amount of change? Well, one, you're dealing with discus, and so discus don't like change a whole lot at all. Two, you're keeping them at a relatively high pH, right? You said pH of 8, right? Yes. So that's pretty high. I mean, a discus in the ideal world would like, hey, man, I'll take upper, mid upper sixes, sevens, okay. Yes, you can keep discus in the upper sevens or even eight. People do it in Chicagoland all the time. Often they're cutting some of that tap water with RO just to make sure that it's not quite so, so hard. But pH is a little high. And if you 
start seeing that pH swing from like eight down to seven and a half, back to eight. That that's starting to get pretty extreme. Seven six, seven five, somewhere in there. If it's starting out at an eight. Dave from Iowa, do you know? Hmm. He's been a member for twenty four months. Dave. It just seems like yesterday. I don't know. It does. Uh, just getting my new 60 gallon breeder set up. Will Ooh. all uh, will all rainbow fish get along with other rainbows? When are you changing the tanks behind you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny question, Dave. Let's just take that last question first. We have we have differences of opinions because do, do we, do we, we do we do because I want to just all of this. Bye bye. I would totally okay. redo this whole area because all oh, the whole area. I don't that's, like that, it. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that, we do have a difference of opinion there. I don't like it. Um, and then the four tanks, I haven't. I was going to rescape them, which I'm still debating. It may be it may be temporary, even if I did, were to rescape them. But I've been leery to do it because there's a lot of babies. We got yeah. we have the least Killy in two of these tanks, the Heterandria formosas, right my little Fermis, yeah. and there are so many little tiny babies in there that I just. I just, I, every time I'm like, and I'm like, oh, I shouldn't, because I really don't want to do anything to those little babies. That's, I mean, that's why you can't see the one tank behind Joanna's head, but there's a big giant blob of subwasser tang in there. They and love the babies, it. it's almost like salt water where they kind of go in and out of there, almost yeah. like it's a coral. And then these guys over here, the, the gold, um, at least killifish, those guys are, the little tiny babies are everywhere. Yeah. But at least in terms of the tank, I think it would be cool to have, we talked about a 55 at one point, but then you brought up the, the best point ever. I was like, well, most 55s have a rim. Uh, I don't know what that's going to look like behind us if we've got just a standard 55 with a rim. So I think we'd want to go rimless, which creates all yes. kinds of problems. So Exactly. So we're still kind of figuring that out. Now, for your first question, the question that pertains to you, uh, rainbow fish. Yeah, for the most part, We've kept lots of different rainbows together. We, we at this point, have had lots of rainbows in the fish room. So we've had Bosmani, Nekolochai, Kurumoi, blue rainbows, red rainbows, all the little ones like the four tails and, you know, the, the smaller ones. Oh, oh uh, um, the dwarf rainbow. Mm -hmm. And we've kept them all at various times together. And I didn't really notice any unusual aggression activity. So, and I know we, I'm missing... Like, oh, the Allen Eye. Oh, that rainbow was so cool. I wish I would have gotten so many more of those. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think it, yeah, 60 gallon breeder would be a good tank for them. It's a four foot tank. They don't need a ton of height. They'll be active and it'd be cool. Now, the next question, Dave, is since you're from Iowa, are you going to go to Quad City? Because if you are, mm -hmm. we're going to have mm -hmm. a bunch of rainbows that we could potentially bring. Just but keep that in mind. It'd be sure. cool, even if not, just, just go to hang out. Oh, Amisa says, thought you were considering a 33 long. I, we did. We did, but it may not be enough for you guys to look at. It it's might too be kind short. Of, you, could, you might be like, what is that back there? It would be shorter than the tanks that we have currently because, because it's only about 12 inches. And these are, with the elevation, at least 13 or 13 and a half, something like that. Because what would be perfect to escape and what would be really fun would be that we have 22 long. But that too would be kind of, it would look kind of yeah, silly it would look it would look shrimpy compared to what we got back there now yeah we need like 200 uh, 200 that's i would not argue with that right i mean jay says want to buy rainbow and fire mouth sickly what type of care does it need and can they stay in a heavily planted aquarium rainbows can uh your fire mouth is going to dig the fire mouths love to dig and so if you've got plants in the substrate most likely they'll try to dig them up uh arthrichthys didn't really eat plants all that much which is Thrichthys maculopennis is the same genus as Thrichthys meekai, which is the uh, fire mouth. So I don't know how much they're going to want to eat the plants, but they're definitely going to dig. But the combination of the fire mouth and rainbows will probably work just fine. I, I imagine they would just ignore one another. At least the Thrichthys that we had and the rainbows that we'd had in that 75 at one time, they didn't interact at all. Uh, Angie Bear says, what, what do you do with fish while rescaping it? If you don't have an extra tank, would Rubbermaid containers be safe temporarily? Yeah, there's lots of mm -hmm. options for that. And that yep. can be very simple, especially if you have, like in some of the tanks that I'm at some point going to rescape. The, uh, if you have a small group, you can put them in a little bucket. You can have a, a little um, specimen container that you can just hang off the side, depending on how long you plan on having them. You could put a little air stone or a, your uh, existing sponge filter. Just kind of Absolutely. put it right in there and they'll stay there for uh, quite a while while you gussy stuff up. But James, oh, I'm going to remember you said this, James. 
Uh, he, said, he knows that I like hilly fish. I do. Uh, he's going to collect some natives uh, when we're down for Daytona. He can catch them in his backyard any day of the week. Nice. Can you imagine? That's pretty cool. <sighs> That's awesome. I'm I'd gonna be remember very you said that. Distracted with if I could catch cool fish. Can you imagine around, that? Just like for area. fun, just like what do yeah. I got? Cool, catch and release. Yep. <laughs> that would be pretty awesome. Hold on, I just saw something. I don't know where it went. Well, it says you both are an inspiration and possess a plethora of information. Oh, oink. It's been a long time since I possessed a plethora of anything, but thank you very much. Love Appreciate you, it. Oink. Everybody say how much we love Oink. She's the best. Gary says, our guppy mama just had 19 babies. First time breeder. Oh. Our tank is going to be filling up. Yeah, it will be. And it's exciting. It's one of the things we were talking about when we were at the, the fish meeting at the Motor City Aquarius Society meeting last week. And that is, it doesn't really matter what you're breeding or how many times those fish have bred. When you see little tiny babies, it's just so rewarding. It's like, that happened in an aquarium that I created. So it doesn't matter if it's guppies or cichlids or some crazy thing. I get really excited about white clouds. I don't know why. But when I see the little white clouds with that little sliver of blue, like baby white clouds to me look so much prettier than the adults. The adults look nice, yeah. don't get me wrong. They but look the like babies, green ants. They, no, they look like they something look better. Green ants. Better. They look no. better. There's nothing better. Yeah. Nothing better or better. Yeah. Uh, Morgan says, what about a 40 lung? Yes, but long. they're hard to find. And they you know, would have a rim. I heard a story that Aquion dis and I don't know if this is true, so please, I'm not trying to sped, spread some rumor that may or may not be true, but I thought somebody told me that the 33 long was discontinued, and I haven't seen the 40 long. We talked about the 40 long, and the problem is still going to be the rim, so we'll have to see like what that looks like, because if it, these are all rimless, but I, I've never liked either, like I'm looking at the picture here, but <laughs> this is very washed out, and I've tried a lot of different things. I've tried it mess with the white balance. I've tried to mess with the lights here. I've tried to turn the lights down there. I've tried I've tried everything. I've tried to deal with um, the settings on our software. I cannot get that to go away. And I bet you if you turned off all the lights back there, it wouldn't be washed out. No, then what would happen is we'd actually be very bright. So <laughs> the, the balance, the backlighting and the front lighting to get mm. the way we are illuminated here, it took a bit of time. I'm not saying I nailed it either. It's just, it is what it is. Sometimes it is what it isn't. Leo says, 60 breeders are nice. Yeah, I agree. Um, I would probably, if I redid any parts of the fish room and wanted to switch tanks out, I, I would like to have a couple 60 breeders. I don't know if I would, if I was only, if I only had one tank, I'd probably still opt for the 75 because I don't find it too terribly difficult to work on, even though it's a little bit taller. But for people who don't want to be standing on a step stool or they have a hard time getting to the bottom of a 75, the 60 breeder is outstanding. But the cool thing with the 60 breeder is, I wonder if I could triple stack those in a reasonable way and still have enough room to work. Because that's, to me, like the 33 longs, that's the advantage there is I like being able to triple stack those 33s. I would much rather, I've got the two double stack 55s, and if I could go back, and someday I very well may, swap out those two 55s for three 33 longs. That would be cooler. Yeah. <laughs> Chase says, changing the background might take away from your beard. <laughs> Don't tell my beard that. We'll keep that to ourselves. Beard might get angry. Wake up. Uh, Charles says, Beard might be messing with me. It was amazing meeting you guys last week. When are we going to get a small scape live? That's a really great oh, question. Yeah, we need to do that. It's been so long because when small scape goes live, it's a Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. yep. When I know I'm awake. Yeah, we're gonna have to. We'll have to work that in the schedule. I'm glad you reminded me. Reminded yeah, because there are a that. lot of people yeah. that that time works really well for. Yeah. Yeah. So and it's cool because then some people who are watching on the replay, they're busy or sleeping on a Wednesday evening but then saturday morning like all right this is pretty cool right I'm awake. especially I'm all awake. of our overseas folks which was like yeah you know at nine o'clock in the morning it's only midday here exactly right now they're sleeping and Unless it was great crazy. meeting you too charles yeah, great at the old yeah. the old uh motor, motor city, city. Yeah. motor city truth will out thank you so much for the super chat appreciate it i didn't see a comment but if you have one joanna will be on the lookout for it appreciate it man glad you're here fish question glad you're here Charles says, I have a 20 long, five albino quarries, eight zebra daniels, mystery snail, tyranerites, and ram's horn snails, 10 blue shrimp, 
What should, could be my centerpiece fish? I have 11 types of plants in the tank also. So obviously our concern is mostly the shrimp because we don't want to get, have those get eaten up. Hmm, centerpiece fish. What size? 20 long, but they're shrimp. That's the, that's the thing. What? I don't know if I trust a true centerpiece fish around shrimp. The smallest centerpiece fish I can think of is a honey grab. I mean, I know they're going to pick off the shrimplets. Chili rasbora. But that's, I'm saying the true centerpiece where you've got one. I know, it's, I'm a it's a joke. I one almost chili. would probably do something like that where my centerpiece might not be a single focal point. It might very well just be a school of fish like the chili rasboras or green kubatai or the lamp eye rasbora or just something, mm -hmm. you know, the CPDs, something like that. And then the other thing I suppose you could do if you wanted to do a center, well, it's not really a centerpiece either, which is, I guess it's kind of different, like a clown pleco. Mm -hmm. Just give you a little bit of a different if vibe. If you saw and, it. Yeah. yeah, if you see it, yeah. A heavily planted tank, it might go missing sometimes. Like, oh, I'll see you every six months. But it'd be exciting when you do. Misa says, I'd love to see you on Saturday. That'd be cool. Yeah, it would be yeah, fun. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah. We really do. Put that on the books. I'm going to put it on the books. Uh, Phil says, I have a week-long conference this fall. What are your thoughts about auto fish feeders? I don't use them because our auto fish feeders are people that come to the house and stay here while we're gone. So when we leave and go somewhere, we usually have, usually there's like people here. I mean, the boys are here. We've got adults here that are taking care of things. So um, if I was going to use, the, the one auto feeder I've used that I liked, I think it was the Eheim. The Eheim auto feeder, which just rests on top of the tank, and it's got four different compartments. The thing you want to keep in mind, even with that, is sometimes it's better to have small pellets as opposed to flake food, because sometimes the flake food can jam those things up a little bit. So small pellets might work. I mean, well, maybe large pellets if you've got larger fish, but pelleted food might be better, especially if you can find the pelleted food that floats for any fish that take food from the top. Oh, wait a minute. I just saw something kind of cool. Oh, Somebody said... Carolyn's here. Hey, Carolyn. Somebody said... What's up? What's up? That pet... Oh, MTS was saying Petco is having a sale on their frameless cubes. If they had a frameless cube that was four feet long, we might have to travel over there, but I have a feeling... Four feet... A four foot tall cube? That would be kind of creepy. Well, it wouldn't uh, be a cube anymore because it would be a rectangle. Um. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm thinking yeah. that... Oh, I don't know if you remember that one tank. I still remember that we, we walked. It was like Naperville area. It was like in a, it was like in a um, industrial yeah, area. Yeah. Remember that? Yep. That was yep, a pre pretty sweet like big cube. Yeah, but yeah. a cube wouldn't work back here because it would be hitting us in the back of the I'm head. I'm aware <laughs> of that. I'm just saying. <laughs> well, this is a different the, the, live stream setup. Yeah. So what's going on with the tank? Literally resting in the back of your head. Well, we went four foot by four foot. Now we're all smashed up against the camera. All you can see <laughs> is like our eyes. And, Guys, this is really creeping oh, me man. out. I'm going to just put the phone down or the, or the iPad. I'm just going to listen, okay, because it's weird. It's really mm -hmm. weird. Yep. They have 24-inch cubes. Yeah, but then it's 24 by 24. I want a cube ounce, that's a yeah. rectangle. <laughs> <laughs> I want All a right. rectangular cube. How about gotcha. that? Gotcha. Gotcha. Maybe they have a cylinder cube for you, right? A cylinder cube. I like it. That would be pretty awesome. Yeah. They have oval oval shaped tanks. That might be kind of cool. Oh, flood but it would distort everything. A little bit. Flood City. I have a frameless marine land thirty by 30, 90, 93 gallon. Ooh, that's cool. I like that. It's yeah. It's very cool. Hold on. I saw another question that I passed up. Carolyn says, "I am glad to be here. I've been MIA because of work. Oh. Hope all's well. We're glad you're here." I'm glad yeah. work let you enjoy life a little bit. Yeah. Today. I think that's Silly awesome. work. Work. Uh, who needs it? I guess we all do. Yeah, if you <laughs> Dang <did>. it. <laughs> yeah. Just got to do the work thing. We'll take a couple more questions. That's Adam's whips thinking, right, why not jump in for maintenance? Yeah, that'd be cool. Cube, that's a rectangle. That don't math. <laughs> I understand that. Hey, Amisa. That's your boy there's Jason a, right there. Yeah, there's a lot of things I'd say that don't quite add up. <laughs> <laughs> Especially least. after too much Seinfeld. Yeah, that was a mistake last right? night. I don't we her dad had it on like the big DVD set. 
And yeah. I started watching it like a few months ago, and then I stopped. I'm like, I gotta complete the series. I gotta complete the whole thing. And last night, one episode turned into two, which turned into three, and all of a sudden, it was like, oh my gosh, it's midnight, and I need to get up early in the morning. So, yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> yeah, but I got to watch the puffy shirt episode. Where he's oh, the really? And the one where the pirate shirt with the hair when. The dude gets in the haircut, but he doesn't want the haircut from the guy. He wants it from his nephew, and then they get caught. It was pretty, pretty awesome. Mm. Steel Waves, thank you so much for the super chat. Thanks for all the great content. So glad you'll be at the Clash. See you there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the Keystone Clash coming up here in the... Gosh, when is that? I get all the things confused now. At some point in the future, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> yeah, they got me doing all kinds of stuff at the Keystone Clash. I think I've got two presentations and judging something. and Fun. Yeah. Good times. Put you to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, that'll work. Oh, Joseph wants to know, bumblebees. How many are a new 40-gallon tank? Well, what kind of bumblebees? I don't know. Bumblebee, bumblebee gobies? Cichlids, bumblebee gobies. If they bumblebees? are bumblebee cichlids, I wouldn't put them in a 40 at all because they get big. The bumblebee well, cichlids do. What if they're actual bees? How then, many would you put in a 40-gallon? I don't gallon? know. I've never been a beekeeper in my life. But if they're bumblebee gobies... I suppose you could probably, in a 40-gallon tank, probably six or eight, maybe. Oh, uh, platies. Joseph Bumblebee says, platies. Okay. That's, I didn't see that coming. Well, but then that's that pretty is, cool to take. I would start with six. And the only reason why is I'd get a couple males and maybe four or five females and then let them breed. And you could do what we were talking about before. We breed a whole bunch of bumblebee platies and be like, where am I going to put all these things? But it, that's kind of the fun. Unless you're going to have fish in there that you know are going to eat the platy babies. If that's the case and you really like them, then you can up your game and do like, all right, let's do four males and eight females, let's say. <laughs> that would be cool. Cheryl says, hi, Joanna. Hi, Cheryl. Uh, I'm commenting on what you said earlier about Instagram. I still miss seeing you on there. I know. Hey, and and green hearts. Slacker. Green heart, green heart. I know, but you know what? There's a number of reasons. Not only do you see what everybody else is working on, which is great. It can be a lot of good inspiration. One, it's too much inspiration for me. So if I get too much, it's like intake, just too much that I don't get anything done. I can't decide. So I see that's cool and that's cool. Oh, yeah. And I want to do something like that. And then I do nothing. And then the other thing is there are certain scapes that I wanted to do when I started my channel. You don't even know that. I drew them out and everything and I've not yet done them. So it's almost like a, you know, get those done and then get some new inspiration. It's so, yeah, I, I miss being on Instagram too, though. I do. At some point, I'm going to be back. I'm going you're, back. You're going back. He says, back. why not bag some fish the night before? Yeah, we've talked about doing that and we're headed in that direction, I think. But I really don't like leaving fish in a bag for that long. But it's, it's it, it, it may happen. The one thing that I've got to do is I don't have an oxygen thingy so i'd have to do that oxygen cylinder so that's why we bag in the morning i do have an auto bag sealer now which is cool and if i did that i'd probably want to put some ammonia lock pads in there as well so there's a couple more things that i would add to the process i tested out our bag sealer because the other thing is i want to make sure it was funny i had upside down bags all over like the kitchen floor because i want to make sure they don't leak exactly. so we got the clamper thing what I have, like 20, 25 bags, just filth water, not fish. Along the wall, uh, like along the back against of the, the couch, wall, upside down, and then if any, there were any wet spots, because you have to adjust the machine, <laughs> and I wanted to make sure that I had it adjusted properly. And so I've got it adjusted properly for the small bags, but not for the large ones yet, at least not to my satisfaction. They're fine for a, you know, a, a few hours, but I don't want to put them in a bag and then overnight. And Plus, the other thing, too, is I really, I, even if I did that, I would never bag large fish or active fish the night before and unfortunately you know if we do a lot of rainbows or cichlids those are fish i just don't want to bag the night before because their metabolism is too high even if you stop feeding them ahead of time uh let's see here jay Hayes says when do you feed fry guppy uh i feed all of our fish twice a day and i think that cuts down a lot on any predation i think that that keeps them happy it keeps them growing consistently and the grown-ups are happy because there's another comment here about somebody asked about the tiger limia. Uh, what do I do to keep them from? Where did that question go? I don't remember who asked it now. Oh, here it is. MNC. Uh, with your tiger limia, do you have a problem with them eating their fry? Nope. And again, I think it's because they get fed twice a day, 
and the tank gets live baby brine. And so the, everybody's really happy. Everybody's nice and full. And I've got a fair amount of hornwood at the top, some decent amount of plants at the bottom. And it just, yeah, I don't, I mean, if they are eating fry, it's not nearly enough to make a difference because that tank has got a lot of babies in it. Lots That's of babies. Sure. Yeah. Lots of babies. This is a fun stocking question. All right. Because this would be a sweet tank. I'm totally jealous. Formula C. How many CPDs, emerald dwarf rasboras? I've always thought those would be a good combo because they're so similar. Uh, and pygmy quarries in a 22 gallon long. 22 gallon long. Mm -hmm. CPDs, emerald dwarfs, and pygmies. I would probably start with 10 to 12 of each. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say a dozen of each. Yeah. And I think, I mean, when I say start, I mean, that would be my goal. My, like, but I don't necessarily think I would add 36 fish to a, 20, a brand new 22 long. I'd probably start with maybe four of each and make sure I've added my Fritz, Fritz Time 7 and maybe some cycled media. And then as long as everything's working out okay, then I would add the rest of maybe the galaxies and then wait a couple weeks, add the rest of the emeralds, wait a couple weeks, add the rest of the pygmies. But that would be cool. I like that would it. be. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Rain says, I took your advice on putting pearl grommies with electric blue car and a 55-gallon all is fine. Curious on what else I could add in there for more color. Well, electric blue car has got a lot of sweet color. But, yeah, that's a good combo. I That can definitely work. Uh, let's see. What would I put in there for more color? Spray How red. about yeah. orange? I was thinking yellow. Red. <gasps> yellow would be really nice. Yellow might be it. interesting, but I would go with the snakeskin barbs because that's got that nice deep red. So a, a nice group of in a fifty-five gallon, let's say, ten snakeskin barbs that'll give you a nice deep red color. So you could do that, and then at the bottom, what if you did some Adolphi quarries or some Venezuela quarries? Mm. Right? Or orange lasers or slash oh. gold laser quarries. So it'd be a little color at the bottom. In a 55 gallon, if you wanted to add some color, you could also do some kind of a cool pleco, like a snowball pleco, something that's not like super, super crazy, or a sultan pleco. Yeah. Would be kind of interesting. Snowball would be pretty sweet. Yeah. So maybe that. Maybe that. What about green barbs? Too finippy. You're finippy. Yeah. But that like would them. look really sweet, though. A legend says, how, might, how many Maltese, Julichromus, Leilupi, Leptosoma, and a 75-gallon, would that be a good community? Good community, you probably won't get a lot of breeding. So as long as you don't care about the baby surviving, if I'm setting up that tank, probably one half is going to be sand and shells. The other half, obviously, is still sand, but more rock work. So your Julius, your Leilupi can hang out in the rocks. Your Maltese are going to be more, and they're going to move the shells around anyway, but at least you'll have an open area for them with maybe like, a rock on that side just to kind of break up line of sight a little bit and then your cypochromus are going to be mid-water upper half of the tank so how many in a 75 gallon i think you could get to a point where you've got a dozen maltese a dozen cypochromus and at least four julies and lelupi and then start there and see what it looks like and you can always tinker with it and add a few here or there <laughs> tinker yeah MNC says, was there any fish at the fish tank barn that are on your list of fish to get? Uh, yes. I liked the trout goodyad. That was one of my favorites that I saw. It was like right when you walk in, I really liked that fish. What's funny is some of the fish that were at the fish tank barn were fish that I uh, that Mike had gotten for me, like some mm -hmm. of the Supercromus and stuff. So we share a lot of similar tastes in fish, especially with his Lake Tang. He, he likes Lake Tang and he can fish clearly, and so do I. So... That's pretty cool. Yeah, that was pretty cool. There were a lot of crypts that I actually wanted to steal, but I didn't. No, no. Walk out of there with a. Why are your pants all wet? Because I got crypts in my pockets. I grabbed uh, some crypts. Bob, this says if the surface of my tank is completely filled with red root floaters and salvinia, will that block or hinder the oxygen air exchange produced for my air stone? It it could potentially block a little bit of gas exchange. Um, if the air stone, it depends on how, how high the air stone is, right? If it's, if it's creating a decent amount of surface agitation, it's less impactful. But yeah, it could block a little bit. I don't know if it necessarily will block enough to make a huge difference. But yeah, it could a little bit. All right, y'all. What do you think? 
Is it time? Oh, wow. That flew. Yeah, I know. It went by fast. Well, because I was blabbing for the first I know. 45, 50 minutes. Uh, next week, we we will have, we're going to do something a little bit different with the giveaway next week because really? it's going to be special. <gasps> yeah. It's going to be a special situation Yippee. going on next week. At least I hope it will be a special situation. So remember that next week, we'll do a, a giveaway slash a special new thing with that. We're going to try something new. Whip, thank you so much for the... <laughs> The bye waving, bye. Uh, waving cat. Appreciate Whip. that. So anyway, yeah, we'll be here. We'll be back. Same time, same place. Next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Got Harley it. giveaway. Yeah, that's that's the new thing. We're going to drive your bike to you. <laughs> um, I don't know if we're going to do that. But but thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. We will see you all next week. Appreciate all the questions and everything that came in and the super chats and for and, the moderators being here. Oh, my here gosh, yeah. And everybody just being awesome. Hi, second we'll floor. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.